Hello all, uh, welcome to another episode of Direct Shift Stories and today we are joined by uh, our CEO uh, Wamshi and Dr. Chris Kaud. Uh, in fact, if you are looking to advance your career, if you want to make the world a better place and if you want to attend the world class masterclass, you've got to listen to uh, the next 45 minutes of this Direct Shift Stories and uh, let's find out more from the founder of uh, the Center for Global Initiatives. Let's find out how an overweight, bullied, dyslexic child became a global humanitarian leader. Wamshi, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Thank you again for um, uh, creating and uh, this, this platform and helping us bring uh, people and um, uh, Humanitarians like Dr. Stout share their stories. Um, thank you, Raj, for everything that you do. Uh, Dr. Stout, uh, privileged to have you here. I'm going to use that word multiple times today uh, because <laughs> you know, our, our, our platform is uh, exactly designed for us to have uh, people like you come and help us enlighten our audience um, and as well as um, you know all the people that we're trying to reach out to. Uh, so once again, thank you for um, uh, being here. Uh, for those of you who um, you know may not um, know a lot about Dr. Stout, um, you know Dr. Stout is a clinical psychologist, you know, well-published author, um, and um, living um, and, the, and the podcast of living a life in full is the producer as well as the host of that, um, as well as um, you know as being an ambassador uh, to UN. I you know I can go on and on um, of the impact that Dr. Stout has created. Uh, to make this world a better place and like raj said somebody that um you know has had a tough journey uh and for him to share how the journey has been has progressed and how the journey has transformed into creating impacts in the in millions of the lives of others is what we want to kind of share with you today uh, so without much further ado i would like to present to you all uh dr stout and to begin with dr stout i'm Apologetic, I may not have done a lot of justice um, to uh, your profile. Um, you know, I could go for the next 45 minutes just talking about your profile. <laughs> I love all the things that you have done. Um, but please, um, you know, enlighten our audience on, you know, a uh, summary of your journey, what has got you till here, and, you know, what you wish to do, you know, in the next uh, fulfilling years of your life. Please give us uh, that background. And then I have a bunch of things that I want to share with you and talk to you about, and then we'll move on. Okay, well, thank you. Thanks. First of all, it's it's a, an honor and a pleasure to uh, share this time with you and, and your audience today. Uh, thank you for having me on. Um, you did a very nice job of uh, kind of describing my background. Um, a lot of challenges, and we'll probably get into that in some of the questions, but uh, basically started off as a uh, clinical psychologist, went to graduate school for that, and started off in kind of the traditional start a private practice, work at a private practice, and be... Um, uh, to treat families and, and kids. Uh, parallel to that, I also had teaching opportunities and some some administrative work uh, in a hospital setting. And just kind of over time and over the years, continued to grow that and expand that. Um, taught at a number of places, and most recently at the College of Medicine at University of Illinois. I was in the Department of Psychiatry there, but actually did more work with their um, back in the day, uh, starting uh, with their um, Center for Global Health. And through that work and through some volunteer work, um, really got involved in the humanitarian space and through um, the great help with some mentors and through some great role models, uh, developed a, a nonprofit center, the Center for Global Initiatives. And now I've kind of shifted my work to uh, being primarily focused on that uh, activity and that work and our new fellowship program. And then also uh, serving as an advisor to um, startups and to some uh, established companies that I've been an advisor for. So a uh, very patchwork kind of uh, history, but uh, happy to, to answer questions or, or go down some rabbit holes if you'd care to in our time today. No, totally, I would love to go down all of those uh, paths, uh, Dr. Stout, thanks for sharing that. Um, so the Center for Global Initiatives, you know, definitely, you know, sounds interesting. Is it uh, specifically focused on um, one area or is it looking at uh, multiple areas for uh, across the globe? 
Um, that's a great question, and it's been an evolution um, that might be of interest to your audience. We first started off, I, I just started off very organically. Um, I had some, I had done some climbs, I had done some travel, and um, some people that I was working with said, um, you know, could you help us out with this project? Could you, um, you know, put us together with, we need to get some uh, medications, we need to get some surgical help, we need to get this or that. And I really didn't start off with, you know, I, I'm a psychologist, that global health really kind of wasn't my uh, area of expertise. And I started talking to some other friends and some other colleagues and put one thing together, another thing together. I went on a climbing trip in Tanzania and met a, a fellow that we've, can, we've since uh, become partners and worked with uh, orphans and worked in two hospitals that he's a part of. And just kind of did it, you know, kind of what I kind of refer to myself, I've written about being called an accidental humanitarian. I didn't really plan it. I didn't take courses in it or anything like that. And um, everything was great. My, one of my mentors said, you know, you need to make this a, a legitimate 501c3. I said, oh, that sounds great. How do I do that? And he said, well, you need to talk to my wife, who was an attorney. He was He's also a Harvard JD. So we did that and they helped me uh, kind of navigate all the um, uh, tax issues and application issues to the IRS. And we were able to get incorporated in Illinois and become a legitimate 501c3. And that was all exciting. And, and I was, again, very naive to things. I didn't know that, you know, there's a different set of tax forms that you fill out and being a 501c3 and all these kind of surprises, they weren't, you know, uh, insurmountable, but they're just sort of not things that you necessarily uh, would, would experience or expect being the, you know, kind of accidentally getting into that. What I basically wanted to do was the work and to, you know, collaborate with other people in that space. And everything was going along swimmingly. We had some colleagues and we had some collaborations. We were working in, let's see, Benin, Bolivia, um, Cambodia, Africa. And in Africa, we were working in Tanzania. Uh, and Ghana, and also in India, and that that was great. And someone came to us from Ukraine, and they said we would like to partner with you all about a project um, with going for a grant with USAID. And we said terrific. So we had meetings, and we learned that what they wanted to do and how we'd have to fulfill the grant was that um, it would be this commitment of three years for the first phase of the grant, and it would require probably me, because I was the only psychologist um, on our board, to um, go to Kiev about four times a year, once a quarter, for a week to 10 days, and to, and to do these assessments. And it was like, oh my gosh, um, I don't have, I have a day job. Everybody at the center, myself included, we don't get paid. This is all volunteer. And I thought, you know, I can't take off. I don't have that much vacation time. I and mean, even if I did, my family would, you know, would not be happy with me saying, you know, I'll see you guys, you know, have a fun spring break. I'm going to be in Kiev. So um, we, we quickly realized that we, you know, could not scale beyond the projects that we were a part of. So I was kind of crestfallen with that and not knowing exactly, you know, well, great, you know, this is kind of, you know, tripping right out of the, the gate and, and not being able to, you know, continue on. And to, to close that story, the, the grant did not get uh, funding. So we, you know, that was not a, a problem that we needed to solve for, and sadly with working with those potential partners. But what it did cause us to do was to realize that we could pivot and that pivot was then to say we had done a lot of work in terms of putting together our um, center. Uh, we had learned a lot of what to do and also what not to do, and that that had value to people. So we, we sort of, with our pivot, kind of uh, said, well, rather than us trying to do all the projects that people invite us to be a part of, why don't we help teach people how they can do their own projects, the proverbial, you know, teach a person to fish or being Johnny Appleseed. So um, in that process, and then just as recently as, as launching uh, this January 2021 as a certificate in a, in a fellowship training program, but we really, our, our, our ethos is to what we call open source humanitarian intervention. And that means that we felt like it shouldn't be so difficult for people to do good in the world. That if someone wants to, um, if they want to join a project, there's plenty of projects out there and, and people find those on their own. But sometimes people through whatever friendships and, and travel or whatever circumstances, find someone or find a circumstance that they feel like, you know, they really take it to heart. I have a friend that's doing great work in Guatemala, just on a kind of a random way. And now he's living there. So these things happen. And sometimes people say, 
I want to build a 501c3, but I don't know where to start. I want to, um, you know, put all this stuff together. And thank you. I see the screenshots. I want to build a website. I want to have a board. I want to uh, do the taxes. I want to submit to the IRS. I want to become a 501c3 and all the, the benefits and the good things that come from that. And other people come to us and say, you know, that's that's great. And but that's really not what I want to do. I want to really help these people to get a well drilled. I want to help these people to have a paved road. I want these people to be able to have a bridge. This these are the specific kinds of things. I don't want to develop a board. I don't want to, you know, go through all the rigmarole and, and wait a year and and submit fees and all this sort of thing to become incorporated. I just want to work on a project. So both those kinds of groups of folks are the kind of the sweet spot of what our center does to help with now and we also then some people maybe don't necessarily even have projects and things but they want to be able to do a um uh, to learn more about these kinds of things. So we have a certificate program for those individuals that uh, is about a 10 week long um, project. And that that program is also all the materials that we have for that uh, are freely available. So if anybody wants to see what that's like, then uh, they can just contact me and we can uh, give them our uh, syllabus and our curriculum. Uh, there is a tuition for it, but all the faculty that uh, teach in the program do it for free. So it's a fundraising effort for the work of our center. Got it, got it, got it. Thank you for all the details, uh, Dr. Sure. Howard. So sure. you know, I, I um, definitely underline one portion of it um, uh, and will fondly remember it. You mentioned um, it should not be so hard to do good in the world. And then, you know, you've tried to act as a channel, as a medium, as a facilitator, you know, of um, you know, people that are trying to do good, but really do not know where to start, how to do, how to propagate all of that. Now, through this work, you mentioned you'd been to you know, all of these various parts of the world. And um, you must have seen you know, as a part of this, you know, because it potentially started as, let's say, a global health initiative, but you must have seen, um, you know, the, the status of, of uh, healthcare in all of these countries. And, you know, there's, as you very well know, as a lot of our audience know, there's so much variability. Mm -hmm. uh, and the pandemic has exposed that variability as much. It has not only impacted health of people, but the economy, economic situations of people. So as you traverse the world, you know, trying to help on a humanitarian grounds, um, what are some of the key takeaways that you have seen from a global health perspective on how these various parts of the country uh, should be adopting newer healthcare plans or what, what else should they be doing? What U.S. as the leader of the world uh, needs to be doing more in terms of you know, bringing more global health partners together so that the variability is reduced and access to care probably is improved. What have you seen? What are some of the key learnings that you've had from this work? Oh, that's a great and complicated question. Um, I, I think maybe, first of all, partnerships are key and critical. Um, mm -hmm. There oftentimes has been a colonial perspective or a West knows best hubris about, you know, we, we, we know how to do everything right and all we need to do is you know, teach everybody to do what, what we do. And I, there's a, a famous individual, uh, Paul Farmer with Partners in Health, and he did a, the, just as a quick little story, he did a lot of work in Haiti. And Haiti, you know, historically has been very resource poor. They've had all sort of, you know, a couple of earthquakes hit. There's just been all sorts of things that have been very challenging. And in spite of all that, and in spite of not having lots of funding and, and lots of, of uh, whatever kinds of resources available, he was able to institute a variety of different kinds of, you know, amazing public health interventions uh, that were sustainable and that were really sort of, you know, hot, hot housed there. They started there. And some of the individuals um, some years ago from um, uh, public health in Boston asked him if he could come teach them some of the things that he had done in Haiti to teach Boston how to do a better job of managing public health resources. And I just, I really love that story because I feel like it talks about um, on, on all the trips that I've been to, um, I, <sighs> I haven't gone because I came as being like Mr. Know-it-all about, you know, here's all the ways, you know, that, that, that there's problems or whatever. People already know what the problems are. They already know what um, they think might be helpful solutions. And my job is to come in and help them realize those helpful solutions. So it might be an issue of resources. It might be an issue of training. It might be an issue. It's always an issue of funding. Uh, but those kinds of things and coming in with a way to help 
using them as partners to make assessments so that we can then have an evaluation to see what when there is an intervention to see if that intervention has you know created the success that we wanted to and then to work with them to be sustainable about it uh, we have a partnership that's been long standing really kind of since 1992 in tanzania and it's just grown and grown and grown and all the things that we've done with them have always come with them asking us telling us what the problem is and asking us you know could we noodle with them to help have a you know create a solution to that issue um, and we do that and then we help link other partners so it's not just us and them it's us and them and somebody else and somebody else and somebody else because there's always going to be sort of a a variability of when you have success with a certain level like we we helped uh, consult with training nurses well that they got nurses way before they asked us to help consult with training the nurses and we had nothing to do with getting the nurses which was in some sense kind of cool so in those aspects and being able to do those kinds of things it's really taught me to say first take a look at you know what they're already doing well because there's chances are a lot of things that are already you know good and positive what can i learn from a, an aspect of a project i was involved in bolivia that might be generalizable to a piece of something going on in tanzania oh i, I love this shot this is great this is uh, some of the kids in our uh, kindergarten um so those kinds of things are always kind of, again kind of keeping this um, uh respect for what is going on and what uh, what are the needs and to have them define what those needs are when we've done fundraising um we just we do the fundraising that's our job that's our skill set that's a sweet spot and i'm not good at it but that's something that we can do and when funds go over i don't say you need to give this many tanzanian shillings to fund this project and this many tanzanian shillings to fund this other project I don't and they because I don't know they're they're the ones that know they are boots on the ground they, this is where they live day in day out and they know what their needs are and then they let us know what that is and we try to do our best to satisfy that and then you know on to the next thing what can we you know help with next next year or whatever we've had we've worked with training we've worked with education we've worked with um, access to medications uh, you know kind of whatever those things are I didn't come up with any any of those ideas that's all been responsive to our friendships and our partners with those individuals and that's what we did in our, our other shorter projects um, that you know were kind of one and done so to speak which i i also want to caution very quickly there's a very bad habit oftentimes of well-intended uh, individuals to kind of come in parachute in put a band-aid on something and then say you know best of luck and, and see you later um, any of the projects that we've exited from have been because they've been short-term projects and those projects were, were were done our partners in tanzania because we're just kind of the closest with them and longest lived uh, we'll continue to work with them and, and then our other aspect is to help others do projects that they want to do yeah, yeah, no, great point. I think partnership and sharing of best practices and learning from best practices wherever they are. Um, again, great points. Um, coming to coming to the domestic status of healthcare, you know, we from a direct shifts perspective, um, and you know, having spent the last fifteen years in in the, in the U.S. healthcare space, you know, have also observed a lot of variabilities. I mean, even even in Hospital operations, what we do is we help hospitals and clinics and others, you know, connect to clinicians directly and, you know, procure staffing, you know, kind of, or hire mm -hmm. them faster uh, so as to be able to provide more access to care. Otherwise, you know, without clinicians, the care access gets uh, so Absolutely. much difficult. Um, uh, and we've seen so much variability even internally, right? I mean, state mm -hmm. to state, um, even within state. Policies, procedures, you know, licensures, you know, there is so much variability. Some form of variability is good because you need that to be customized to the state, uh, but some variability quickly becomes hurdle, uh, hurdles and, you know, uh, access to the care. But yeah. what we've learned is, again, pandemic grayed out all those lines. One of the, let's say, uh, advantages of going through tough situations is you gray out the borders, you know, you are able to now you know, as you very well know, as you, you are able to see what are the possibilities if we did not have these limits or the borders. Uh, I think from being able to share clinicians' expertise across the boundaries of state lines has been a big um, uh, win over the last yeah. uh, you know, eight to 10 months, et cetera. So we have kind of experienced that uh, and have always thought um, what should be some of these policies that the government should be taking up as a priority 
that would ease access to care right i mean access is the first first mm -hmm. portion um any thoughts on that dr stout on what you have seen as what should be the key priorities the trends with respect to access to care that could potentially be improved uh, and have you seen some improvements in the last few months sure um Scaling down, um, I had done work at the United Nations and then obviously the work with the Center and World Economic Forum around healthcare in issues on, the, on a global scale. Mm -hmm. And you see different kinds of payer models. Um, you know, certainly just to the north of us in, in Canada is different than what we have here. Certainly going to, um, you know, the UK and national health system and health services uh, are very different. But I think one of the things I, I heard someone talk about that they were saying that uh, this is in an academic setting that they had tried, you know, they had committee after committee and they had tried for like decades um, to try and get more technology to be able to do education. And then uh, all it took was this pandemic and within like a month, you know, everything all, you know, classes were all digital, et cetera. And I think a lesson for healthcare from that to your point about access is that um, the, I, and I've also, I should also say that I, I worked um, for the state of Illinois um, for the Department of Mental Health in our psychiatric private or public psychiatric systems. I've worked in private psychiatric systems and access to care is always kind of a stumbling block. Um, it's some, and it can be sometimes just because people don't have the physical ability to get to a clinician. I think telehealth is huge with being able to help with that. And I think a lot of um, uh, state as well as uh, licensing uh, ent uh, ent um, entities, which I'll talk about more in just a second, have now become much more open-minded about these kinds of things. And even if not everybody you know, can afford a smartphone, but I know that um, there's been a lot of projects uh, kind of um, uh, one-off projects to see, well, what if we gave people smartphones and they could manage their um, their healthcare with it or manage their uh, income with it from uh, people that are on welfare, et cetera. And those have been very promising, but some of the problems were there was, to, that I think is very much in the sweet spot of what your work is, is access on the clinical side of it, on the healthcare side of it to clinicians. I mean, people can have all the tech in their hand and, and, and broadband and everything else, but if there's no one, so to speak, to answer at the other end, then, then what are you going to do? I think from my you know, point of view, starting off as a psychologist, things like telehealth services with psychology is like the, one of the easiest things in the world to do. I mean, I've seen wonderful tech with dermatology, with pediatrics, with women's health, with, with uh, primary care. And those are, to me, a lot more complicated than psychotherapy is. And especially when you can have like our forum, right? This with visual, you know, eye to eye, not just, you know, telephonic things that have been around for, for a long time. So I think in, in particular in the Midwest, uh, there have now been uh, changes in statutes and laws to allow um, better telehealth practice. So mm -hmm. I'm licensed in the state of Illinois. Well, if I have a patient that is now uh, sheltering in place that's moved to Wisconsin, there's a question. It's a gray area. Can I treat that patient? Even though I started off with that patient, let's say in Chicago, I'm still in Chicago. The patient, you know, stepped two inches across the border to Wisconsin. Am I now practicing outside of my statutes because my license is Illinois, not two inches outside of Illinois into Wisconsin or Indiana or Iowa or wherever else? And those now there's interstate uh, pacts that are uh, allowing that to happen. Um, there's a lot more uh, platforms now available in the last certainly within the last uh, two years and probably even more within the last six months to have people feel more comfortable about being able to do those kinds of things so i think having those opportunities and having even clinicians because not all clinicians are super sophisticated uh, with the technologies mm -hmm. either so i think being able to have the, uh, the supply side of therapists whatever or, or or providers healthcare providers of any kind of specialty um, be able to then have the tools to then meet the demand side of now individuals that might have technology or more comfort with that to be able to access them that maybe don't have a car or don't have uh, access to public transportation or don't feel comfortable, you know, going to a waiting room these days. Um, those are the kinds of things that I think, you know, we're, we're all kind of sorting it out right now and kind of being able to, to figure it out. And the final thing that I was kind of disappointed about, I, I wrote with great optimism, um, a LinkedIn influencer piece a while back, um, probably 
Oh, 1998 or so, um, I was very optimistic coming. You, you, they, they want you to make these predictions for the upcoming year, and I'm horrible at predictions. So every year I follow up with how, I, how many predictions I got wrong, and then here I'm going to make some more wrong predictions about the upcoming year. And one of the things that I, I now am, am sad about um, is that I had great optimism, and, and falsely so, about Haven. Uh, I had thought that if you got Amazon and Berkshire Hathaway and JP Morgan together, lots of funding, lots of smart folks, the original, I don't know if he's going to be CEO or CMO, Atul Gawande, who is just an amazing physician, uh, wrote the Checklist Manifesto and a number of other amazing works, um, was going to be heading that up. I thought you've got an amazing brain trust. You've got a, three big checkbooks. You've got all this, you know, potential uh, to, to do amazing kinds of things. And even with that, it still kind of crumbled and collapsed. Um, I, I advise a number of startups. Some uh, are doing very well and, and some have, you know, gone, gone by the wayside over the years. But one of the things that I've seen is that the ones that tend to go by the wayside, be it the, the behemoths with great potential like Havens or much smaller, modest startups, are that it's folks that may come from a background that is not healthcare and they don't realize all the things that you know, which is, you know, getting a license in one state doesn't mean that you're licensed in every state. Uh, being a provider in this network doesn't mean you're a provider in every network. I mean, there's so many little interstitial variables that create all these burdens for the providers and the providers oftentimes, you know, have to wait and wait and wait and wait. When I worked with the state, the state had a financial budget crunch. Uh, community mental health centers weren't getting paid. They went out of business. By the time that funding came, there was no funding to go to all the centers because not all of them still existed anymore. So those are the complications that when you're doing a, a startup for a cool app or you're Elon Musk, you know, shooting rockets into space and creating really cool cars, you don't have, you, yes, you obviously have regulations and you've got, you know, astrophysics working against you, but you still, it's, it's, th those are obvious kinds of things and those are science. The politics and the complications that come along with payer systems and the variability around that are the, some of the problems that uh, founders that don't come from healthcare originally have no idea and are, you know, sadly surprised. No, those, those are all great points. I think, um, I think you hit upon something really well, which is, um, you know, the, the understanding of the assumption that um, tech can help healthcare get better is a very safe assumption, a good one to make, but infusing it with tech that is ill-informed by how actual healthcare works from a patient side, from a payer side, from a provider side, with so much variability across all these three sectors that is not correctly informed um, any amount of tech cannot solve the problem. I, I think, uh, you know, you said it very right. Um, you know, during the early, early days of um, you know, our, our company, we, we work with clinician staffing, you know, it's, it's some, some of the intricacies involved in healthcare are embedded in the work in the areas that we operate in. Uh, we found the need to bring in clinical advisors. So in fact, we had clinicians that were on our platform registering to actually get connected with employers to find staffing and jobs. We had some of them work as advisors to us to give, uh, what great. should the platform look like? You know, what should the services look like? Where should we be focusing? And, um, no, that's a great point. I think, um, you know, irrespective of how big uh, the company is, how much funded it is, uh, if it doesn't have, uh, it's, it's like, you know, I, I, I remember a poem that I read as a kid, which is no matter how great of a curry you make, how many ingredients or other stuff that you put in it, if you do not have a pinch of salt in it, um, you know, your, your, your curry is over <laughs> you. <laughs> I like that. That's good. That's good. And, and I like, I, I totally, I agree with your point and want to underline it. I mean, it's, it's, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm a geek. I, I love technology and, and just, you know, it's, I, you know, the, I'm an early adopter and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, just into all that. And, the, the, the flip side of it is that, you know, technology applied to things without some forethought 
uh, just causes you to create problems, you know, that much more faster and efficiently. <laughs> you know, you're not you're not solving them just because you you know you've thrown a, a cool app, you know, in the app store or something that you you really need to know what it is that you're looking at and to as best you can. You know, it, it's hard to know what your blind spot is by definition, but what you did by virtue of going to your customer Customers, seeing about customer experience and then also learning from them, you know, how can we fix the problems that you're suffering from? That's that's critical. That's that's a very smart, wise way to do what you've done. No, great, great. Thanks, Dr. Stout, for that. Um, so uh, you advise a lot of companies, established ones, startups, etc. Uh, from a health tech perspective, um, you know, the last, let's say, two years has seen you know, a big explosion in terms of the health tech um, growth and you know more and more companies venturing into infusing technology into healthcare um having the actual healthcare operations knowledge and deeper knowledge of the problems that healthcare faces is an important aspect what other things would be your advice as to some of these healthcare techs um you know, that are coming up um, um and you know now patients are infused with you know more apps and more technology options hospitals are now you know, looking at multiple different softwares to run their operations. You know, there's a lot of those things coming up, uh, as you very well know. And then, you know, CMS is constantly coming up with, oh, if this is, you know, an enabler, we will help get extra reimbursements for those enablers. So those policies are changing. So it has become like a cyclical work. You change the policies, you have to incorporate that back into your process flow, your workflow, and, and all of that. So based on that, what has what are some of the other key recommendations or advices to these health techs that they should definitely keep in mind as they think of solving some of these problems? Great question. I I think sometimes there's a risk in in early on startups to kind of fall in love with their tech, uh, and it gets back to, circles back to that same point that we've already made about you know make sure that um, the problem that your technology is solving uh, you know a true problem that is actually out there. Um, I had referenced and, and given a, a LinkedIn uh, article a while back about looking at, again, making bad predictions about the number of uh, healthcare wellness startups there were in, in the app space. And one of the companies I actually uh, consult with said, well, you know, here's all these other companies and they're in the app store. So that's sort of this tacit approval. And I said, well, being in the app store doesn't mean that FDA has approved this. And yeah. technically, you don't need FDA approval. There are these, there's a new area, relatively new area, a couple of years, I guess now, of uh, digital therapeutics, which actually do require an FDA approval, which is a whole other, you know, set of, 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 of issues and good and bad kinds of things. But for, for generally, for other startups, um, really take a look at the fact of does your product work? Uh, which sounds so ridiculous, but there are so many people say, well, yeah, it works because the code works or because if you click on this, it does that and it does these other things. They're looking at the algorithms. They're looking at the functionality of it. And I'm, I say, no, 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 take a step back. Does it clinically work? Um, do you know, I mean, you know, in your heart of hearts or you feel like, you know, it's got face validity. Well, if the person does this, this and this, then this should be the outcome. It's like, well, have you tested that? Does it work on someone that's 20 as well as it works on someone that's 60? Does it work on men as well as it works on women? Does it work on um, people that are generally healthy in other areas? Uh, you know, or, or is it only a very specific niche kinds of thing that, that is only sp dealing with this kind of problem as long as they have no other comorbidities? and no other other no other kinds of problems and they say well we don't know well <laughs> then i say well we need to study that that needs to be um looked at and even though i i mimic i model from um our, our friends in uh, the drug development area in pharmacology to say you need to do a randomized control trial and you need to have a either a control where it's, it's treatment as usual and then you're the experimental drug being whatever your tech is your app your algorithm your whatever and let's match cohorts let's get large sample sizes let's be able to um, uh, deduce does it work does it work across all groups of people does it work across all circumstances et cetera, et cetera. what is the sweet spot if it is generalizable, great. If it's niche, that's fine. Then let's focus our marketing on that niche, not everybody. Who's going to pay for it? I have to. I can't tell you how many companies um, that have that have come to me and they say, "Well, this is so great. It's so whiz bang. People will pay for this out of pocket." 
Well, you know, go to the app store. Most apps are free. People hate to spend $1.99 for an app, which is kind of ridiculous. But then also they say, hey, I got health care insurance. If I'm paying a premium on my health care insurance, why do I need to pay for this extra? You know, what, what's the benefit of that? So if that's your value prop to say, I have to be in my company or my company's product so great that they are willing to pay, you know, let's say your, your, your healthcare insurance is, you know, $300 a month or something, that they're now going to pay even $5 more a month to be using your app and your system. That, that may still be too high of a hurdle. They may want it yeah. for free. So then you have to say, well, who else? Maybe there have been so many companies that have pivoted to say it's not the end user, the patient, because there's such a disconnect between payment and provider and patient, that then you say, maybe if we went to the employer and sold it to them and so showed that we could increase, increase productivity, decrease absenteeism, decrease presenteeism, uh, have workers be more comfortable with managing stress and better wellness kinds of things, which are always squishy metrics to try and take a look at. Or maybe we go to the, the third party payers to say, hey, you guys are in the business, two businesses. One business is to provide care to your members. The other business is to manage the dollars spent for that care to the employer who is ultimately paying for the, the lion's share of that care. So if we go to a payer and say, you know what, if you pay us, I'm making this up in a per member per month, but if you pay us a dollar per member per month, we can show you a return on that dollar of a, of a nickel or a quarter or whatever. So you pay for us and you get a benefit. Those are the kinds of metrics that then whoever's writing checks are going to want to pay attention to that company. Yep. No, no, all great points. Exactly. I think, uh, um, you know, you hit upon something really nice, which is from a payer, payer side, most of the um, apps, you know, like you mentioned, oh, we created an app um, and, you know, you price point it and then you release it thinking, you know, all patients will come use the app. First of all, is it connected to all the things that the patient wants it to be connected? Because there are now so many information mm -hmm. sources. And secondly, the pairs are always, uh, the patients, the customers, consumers of healthcare, always comparing all of this against their own respective health insurance, which has been a hot topic. Um, mm -hmm. um, so th th those are great points, absolutely. Uh, that brings me to, you know, you touched upon that a little bit, you know, from a mental health perspective, um, as well, there has been, such a changing trend in the mental health space. So many new solutions coming forward um, uh, with a promise of creating better access and quality of mental care, uh, mental health care. You know, especially because you know, as as many of our audience and as you all know, um, uh, mental health is in, in many parts of the world as well as you know many parts of the country sometimes is not correctly recognized as a need. Um, or, or is it not recognized at the right time as a need? So um, having said that, do you see a lot of these newer solutions, new technology infusions and all of these things uh, coming and helping in the mental health space as well, uh, Dr. Stout? Um, if not, you know, have you seen anything as you traverse the world? Have you seen best practices with respect to mental health in specific parts of the world that... Um, you know, potentially we could um, just import or imbibe and absorb and start to implement? Um, there are certain cultures, I think, um, are a bit more open-minded to getting involved in, let's, let's, let's call psychotherapy in the, in the aspect of mental health, the aspect of psychotherapy as opposed to medication pharmacology for a second. So in that context, um, for example, um, uh, in Argentina, it's not uncommon at all to sort of, you know, have your own therapist. And oftentimes, you know, that's something that people will have great pride in and, you know, talk about, well, my therapist is better than your therapist kind of a thing. And, and the traditional, um, what I think is, you know, kind of historic of, of um, psychoanalysis is, is kind of where, you know, from whence a lot of psychotherapy has, has come as being very much uh, in vogue and popular and zero stigma. And if anything, almost the opposite of that, that people, you know, are, are proud about it and share it with with others. There are many, many, many other countries and somewhat the United States, I think included, which there's still a remarkable amount of stigma around that. Um, I certainly saw it early on in my career. Um, you would hear that from a variety of people. Stuff really had to get bad before they would go, um, you know, try and seek help from a, a third party, a licensed psychologist or a social worker or what have you. And I think 
it has become so, I would like to think, again, maybe I'm fooling myself, but the the, the news feeds and the things that I see from, from the Wall Street Journal to um, the publications from the American Psychological Association, it seems like um, people are much more open-minded about this now. Uh, somewhat because of the pandemic, I think, and somewhat the, the side effect of the pandemic of people working and going to school from home now um, has increased a variety of different kinds of stresses. There's still workplace stress, but that place is now at home as opposed to an office setting. And I think the fact that people can uh, access more uh, legitimate, good, empirically supported uh, psychotherapeutic services like cognitive behavioral therapy in particular um, through whatever kinds of technology platforms, uh, which there's a variety that provide cognitive behavioral therapy, um, that the stigma is reduced, that there's just now so such a greater abundance, let's say, relatively speaking, that it's not something that people have to go looking for. They can, you know, it'll be in their news feeds on, you know, newspapers and television, whatever. But um, then there's a lot of, of, of the supply side to kind of meet that demand. And there's a variety of variation. The problem then becomes back to what we were first talking about, not so much about access, but how do you choose? How do you know? And that's always been the case. You know, how do you know? If you want to go see a psychotherapist five years ago, pre-COVID and all this, um, you would see what your insurance was. You would see who's in your um, uh, provider network if you have a PPO. And then you would you know, get the phone numbers of you know, three or four therapists and chat on the phone, et cetera. And I think there's also you know, people, um, therapists now uh, do more marketing, but still, it's hard for people to properly judge and vet, you know, what's the proper credential? People don't know, you know, they see a lot of folks with alphabet soup behind their names. Um, and, you know, well, what's the difference between a counselor and a psychologist and a therapist and a social worker and a psychiatrist? And can't I just see my physician and get a pill prescribed and those kinds of things? There's, there, there are now, again, there's a, an abundance online of being able to try and you know, learn about that. But I'd highly recommend to listeners that might have an interest in this, um, you know, go to legitimate sources. There's a lot of fake news out there, as we certainly all know. But go to sources that, um, you know, that are uh, like the American Psychological Association, or the American Psychiatric Association's websites. Those those are vetted websites that aren't, you know, scams or anything like that. They're not going to sell you anything, but that you can then learn about, well, what are these kinds of differences? You can go to the uh, NIMH. There's a lot of .gov resources as well, too, that you can see. So um, back to those kinds of points that there, there's a much greater abundance. There's much lower stigma. Um, but, you know, is it something that uh, insurance will pay for? Probably a little bit more likely now. There's been a lot, even the blues in the Chicago area and Midwest, you know, opened up to uh, telehealth services being paid on par with what traditional in-office face-to-face was. Because that was the other problem for providers to say, I'm providing just as much work um, and just as much, you know, good clinical outcome, but now I'm getting paid, you know, uh, 80% on the dollar or something. Well, that's, you know, that's, that's not good for sustain sustainability of providers, which goes back to the company, you know, your company and, and the work you do. If you don't have providers that can afford to be providing services, then you're still going to have a deficit in people not being able to get the help they need with or without technology. Oh, yeah. No, that's a great point, especially the last one that you just made, uh, Dr. Stout, which is um, having enough of those providers. Because now the problem is, how do you choose? How do you make the right selection of who to go to? Uh, we are working with um, you know a few mental health companies that have contracted with us to help them um, you know, source more mental health workers, more mental health clinicians, therapists, social workers, psychologists, etc., that can become a part of their ecosystem so that they can provide more care and better care. Um, and some of the learnings that we have had is some therapists out there, etc., have um, you know have issues with what they're getting paid. Uh, that they do not want to become a part of an ecosystem that really does not appreciate their work as much as they want it to be done. Um, so payment is still a big issue. Um, and um, you know, a lot of technology companies have said that you know we make access to care better. So volumes will take care of the payment. But I think still uh, providers are looking for better payment solutions, you know, like you rightly said. Um, and hopefully yeah. that you know will continue to evolve. Um, now that that brings me to you know one part that I've always been thinking as we were working with these mental health companies, um, newer models of primary care have evolved, you know, as you probably very well know, like direct to employer primary care, where primary care providers are 
contracting, collaborating directly with employers so that they get the whole cohort of those employees as their patient population and they start providing concierge level primary care to all those employees. Win-win for everybody, patient, you know, employees get better access. Um, you know, em employer is satisfied because the patient, you know, his employers are more healthier, brings down mm -hmm. the premiums. We have always been thinking as we started working with mental health companies, providing staffing to them, are there such models evolving in the mental health space as well? Like direct to employer mental health care providers, not just primary care? Uh, because again, I want to hear your thoughts on uh, potentially the contribution of the employer work environments to mental health um, or the lack thereof. Uh, and how can some of those direct to employer, direct to employees mental health models um, evolve and what should, what kind of work should be done in that space? That's a great question. I think it's it's an interesting um, historic kind of perspective. Back in the late 1980s, I worked in an integrated behavioral health care system that had inpatient and outpatient and residential, et cetera. And this was an era where there's a the Joint Commission on the Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations, JCAHO, said we're going to start looking at outcomes. So we took a look at um, measuring outcomes, clinical outcomes. How quickly did people get well with whatever kind of problem they had, with however many visits or what kind of types of psychotherapy or pharmacology or combinations thereof. And we took that and developed it into a product and did direct contracting in the late 1980s. So historically that existed. And the, I think now the sophistication of it could be to then look at, you know, two sources direct to employer and then offer to them, you know, the, the, the you can, again, depending upon what state and laws and things like that, you can offer capitated plans where there's shared risk between the provider group and with the uh, employer. Uh, you can do case rates. Um, there's a variety of different kind of payment models and structures that um, are very much applicable, I think, to behavioral health, just as well as you know primary care and some other specialty care, perhaps pediatrics and derm and things like that. Um, I've also seen it in the orthopedic space, uh, doing some work uh, with that, uh, with capitation. But the the most or least can, uh, common denominator in it is being able to, to demonstrate clinical outcomes. People, the risk for providers is to say, if I'm working on a per member per month, my job is to not see patients. I actually will make more money, you know, if I'm getting paid and, and doing less work. That's, you know, that's kind of a, 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 a almost a perverse incentive. So the way to balance that and, and push back against that is to say that, you know, we have the proper dosing of whatever our care is and whatever that type of care is so that we can demonstrate our clinical outcomes. And then we go at risk. Um, I did a, a talk a while back on uh, uh, should healthcare come with a price guarantee? So, you know, after, um, you know, after six months post discharge from being an outpatient in psychotherapy, if there's still problems, do I get to come back for free for, you know, five visits or something? Or do I, you know, how, how does all that that stuff works. So there's a more details than what our time allows, but um, there's a, a variety of people that have written about that and experimented with that in, in terms of uh, ways to do it, not just in behavioral health, but but um, orthopedics and other areas as well. And I think that's that's exciting because it also puts the onus where a provider you know should be responsible for the work that they're doing. Psychotherapy is a little, you know, difficult because new stresses can happen the day after a person, you know, in psychotherapy that, that weren't there before. But nevertheless, I think there's ways through um, different risk management tools to be able to do that, make it affordable, make it sustainable, even if you have, you know, one or two black swan unpredicted events to still stay viable as a practice. Oh, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, great point. Great point. Um, um, it I, I did want you to kind of um, talk about this earlier, but I think, you know, I'll, I'll try, I try to um, touch upon this a little bit because I want to get your thoughts and want to brainstorm uh, this with you, uh, Dr. Stout, especially with respect to um, burnout. Um, and, um, you know, whenever I think of um, you know, your, your podcast, Living a Life in Full, uh, I, now I know exactly why you named it that way. I think you are uh, living a life in full. Um, again, thank you for all the work that you do, um, you know, all the aspects of human life that you have touched across the globe. Um, so that itself is a great example of living a life in full. Um, having said that, a lot of people in our network are clinicians, um, you know, because we are our ultimate, our mission is to connect these clinicians to where the care opportunities are. Um, and 
as you know, we all know, there's been a lot of talk about clinician healthcare workers burnout um, over the last 10 months, a lot more than ever before. Right. Um, so, and we could easily anticipate what could have caused it, what are the things that are causing it, you know, how that continues to be exacerbated. And now that is intimately tied to mental health and wellness of clinicians, which, you know, automatically is tied to wellness of the larger population. If your clinicians are well, you know, your population is well. Um, so we have had a lot of discussion with, you know, some of our clinicians on what are they seeing out there as avenues for them, you know, to minimize their burnout, you know, to optimize their mental health. Um, what should, um, you know, a clinician, um, especially with COVID or pandemic changing the landscape of care going forward and potentially, uh, you know, clinicians work is, is going to get, you know, uh, more challenging than what it was before. You now they have to you know, manage through multiple apps, multiple care settings, et cetera, multiple acuities of patients. Um, and I think viruses like COVID are, or mitigated, but probably are, are, are not going away as much as we want them to be. So there are a lot of situations that could cause the clinicians to, you know, continue to feel frustrated, angry, burnt out, and all of those things. So are there enough avenues that you have seen that are helping our healthcare workers? And, you know, what are your thoughts on, especially, you know, our audience is, is a large um, you know, clinician network. What would you suggest to them on you know, how to monitor uh, mental health and burnout as they produce their clinical work and how to seek avenues of help? It's a very challenging um, circumstance. I think that oftentimes clinicians feel like, you know, they have to, to grin and bear it. Uh, oftentimes physicians in particular, you know, have just rig rigorous uh, trainings and residencies and sl sleep deprivation, et cetera. A lot of first line healthcare providers in emergency rooms um, and uh, people working with challenging cases in ICUs, which have just been, you know, are, are difficult on a good day, let alone during a pandemic and people being understaffed. And now people, healthcare providers concern themselves about becoming ill. Those are things that don't necessarily happen to uh, behavioral health care providers like they might with, you know, some of their colleagues in, in non behavioral health specific fields. I think. Part of the thing, it's it's so idiosyncratic from you know to per, person to person, um, but the systemic kinds of things might be looking at issues of how can we help workflow, um, how can we we as let's say and what I'm saying we is like a, a, a clinic director or a hospital administrator, someone in a leadership clinical leadership role, um, what can be done to minimize the kinds of things that are really the, the grain and the gears that really cause people to, you know, people love the work they do. People, you know, therapists and, and, and healthcare providers of whatever stripe love the patient contact, love the patient interaction, um, but they hate the paperwork. They hate, you know, in the back of their mind feeling like, okay, I'm doing this and I know it's going to take me three months to get paid for, you know, for this bill because the insurance company drives me crazy or because, you know, whatever, or gosh, now I'm on three different, you know, platforms now to do my medical records because I've got three different payer sources and none of them crosswalk amongst one another. Or now I need to talk to this person's primary care physician and that person's never available and I don't have time to do that until like eight o'clock at night. At eight o'clock at night, I'd like to be in bed at home, those kinds of things. So if there's ways, and those are challenges for leaders. I mean, if those were easy solutions, they wouldn't be problems. So um, those are the kinds of things that I feel like are a shared burden across, you know, hospitals, clinics, uh, private practices, et cetera, that, uh, you know, if there can be, if there can be integrative technology solutions. I mean, we heard years and years ago that electronic medical records are going to be this, you know, wonderful benefit for everybody. And they just become sort of a, a, you know, a joke and a meme for most people. And most people are frustrated and people, patients complain, you spend more time with the computer than you spend with me. So, you know, we still need to tweak. Those are great challenges for startups to take a look at of how can we make a synthetic, positive patient interaction, patient provider interaction 
with support of technology to do the stuff that technology is better at and like taking notes or whatever that then uh, make the life and the, the lifestyle of that provider, you know, all that much easier, not, not drudgery and not yet another thing that's going to suck up time from them. Yep. Yep. Uh, very well said. I think, uh, I think how can enablers be true enablers? I think that's a simple question. Yeah. For, for all <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Dr. Star, you have been, um, you know, multifaceted and you have seen success in multiple areas. Um, you know, you, you're a doctor, clinical psychologist, you're an influencer, you're a humanitarian, you've been an ambassador, um, you're an advisor to companies, um, created impact in multiple areas across multiple, you know, many millions of lives. How do you manage, you know, your energy? How do you manage your time? And how are, what is your advice to people like us and everybody hearing us and listening to us on, um, if they were uh, to target accomplishing so many things uh, in such, such short span of time, you know, with such limited time and energy, um, how do we do it? How have you done it? Well, uh, thank you for saying that. Um, it, it hasn't happened quickly. It's It's been quite a few decades in the making. So not not all of this, uh, you know, just happened overnight. So it's just kind of, stay, you know, staying alive long enough and, and keeping at it. Um, one thing that I would say, and I hate to call it a hack, but it's kind of like that, is to think about the work that you do, um, if there might be other benefits that might be able to uh, simultaneously be done from it. If you think about the, you know, the, the cliche of two birds with one stone, or if you think of the, the image of a, of a Venn diagram and overlapping circles and that, you know, collective dark spot where they all start to overlap. Uh, like, for example, when... Um, I probably like if I write for LinkedIn, I'll write, you know, an idea and I'll, I'll put it together and I'll put it out to the world and then I'll get comments and critique and criticism back on that that might help me further develop that idea. And as I further develop that idea, then that might turn into something that's a, a journal paper. And then I submit that for journal review and peer review. And then I get their critique and feedback. And then I think this is good. I, there's a couple of other people that I've referenced in the work that I've done in a scientific paper. And maybe I know them or maybe I don't. I reach out to them and say, hey, this is something that's really, you know, an, an itch I need to scratch. I'm really curious about this. Would you be interested in collaborating with me and talking about, you know, I have some questions for you, which is kind of like what I do with podcasts, but um, put it in more of an academic kind of perspective. And then if I can start to stitch together five, eight, 10, 12 of those colleagues, I then pitch it to a publisher and say, here's my idea, here's my concept, here's a sample chapter, here's a sample table of contents, here's all the other people that would write around these areas and this is their experts in, in these fields. Um, would you be interested if we put together an edited book on topic XYZ? And you farm that out, you get a publisher that says yes to it, then you put together that book over the course of you know 12 to 18 months. Uh, that book comes out, which is terrific. Then you adopt, well, you don't necessarily adopt it for a class, but then you use that and you teach students about some of the things that you learned from that. And then they go out and they propagate those ideas and they then have their own ideas. And then they write papers and then they write book chapters and then they publish books or they then apply it to their clinical practice or they apply it to doing a startup. And then you, people liked your book and they want to know more about it. And then you go out and you give a lecture or two on that. And then you meet people in that audience that have a similar uh, ilk and interest. So that just using sort of a the scientific academic model in, in that one aspect, the, the the meta aspect of that hack is to say whatever work you're going to do, if it's if it's worth doing, then do it really well. Do it really, you know, with 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 external critique and criticism to make it better, which isn't fun, but is certainly helpful. And then see how you can build from that. And then over the course of you know, of a 35 year career, then those things kind of start to add up and you have this nice network of people. Um, you share as much as you can. I feel very blessed and, and grateful for all the people that helped me out. Now it's kind of, I've always tried to help people, but especially now at this point in my life that it's kind of my turn to really kind of be that mentor and help people out and open doors and write book endorsements. I had a, a, a wonderful email from a colleague of mine that we'd worked together 20 years ago. She said, I've got a new book coming out. Here's a PDF of the manuscript. Would you mind doing a, you know, an endorsement for the back cover? And I was like, of course I would. And plus, I'm just tickled to be able to read your new book. You know, so the, all of those kinds of things, just being open to helping others. And if you think about it in a business context of startups and things like that, certainly you want to help people, but you, I, I can't, I'm not 
great for every single startup that comes my way because I don't have expertise in it. So I tell those folks right off the bat, once I kind of learn who they are, what they're up to, if I can add value, then I'd be happy to see if I could be of help, test me out, you know, for, for two quarters. And if I'm helpful, you know, let's keep doing it. If I'm not, no, no harm, no foul. I'll be happy to, you know, see if I could refer you to somebody that could do a better job than I could. Because I just sort of feel like now in, in this phase and kind of what's coming next is really a trying to give back kind of way. And, you know, the, the center gives back in a variety of ways and has for a decade, but me personally doing it in other kinds of ways to kind of expand that, that, you know, there's sort of a, a biblical thing in, in Romans about, you know, he who has given much, you know, has much responsibility to give back and give to others. And that's kind of where, you know, that's my ethos these days. Now that's, that's so well said, Dr. Stott. Thank you so much for saying that. And that's, I think, you know, a perfect, perfect, uh, you know, ending to you know this great episode of this podcast. Um, you know, I'm going to remember, do what you're doing really well. Always be cognizant of that overlap where you can do multiple things and, you know, look at what the overlap is and then help people. You know, if you are, if you continuously take more responsibilities of helping people, that automatically means you're growing. Um, thank you for those uh, learnings, Dr. Stout, and thank you for um, giving us all the information learn and you know learnings from you know your work and your life and you know enriching um, all of our audience today uh, again like i said it has been a privilege to have you on our platform uh, and bring to the wider audience um uh, you know your story and hopefully we have done a little bit of our uh, part today in bringing you out to our network well, thank you. I appreciate that. And, and right back at you. I've um, been a uh, consumer of your content and your shows. They're very, very well done. And I appreciate, you know, the fact that the work that you go to putting this together and the work that you do, you know, day in, day out in the day job is just fantastic. And I, I applaud you and your colleagues for what you've been able to accomplish. Thank you so much, Dr. Stop. Raj, thank over you. to you. Okay. Thank you all. Uh, so, only uh, thing I would say is if you love rock and roll, listen to the rock star, international rock star, <laughs> Dr. Krishna. As uh, American Psychology Association had uh, uh, coined the term uh, international rock star in psychology. Thank you so much for all the listeners. If you're watching this or if you have, uh, if you're going to hit the replay, uh, we would uh, recommend you to share your reviews or uh, drop in your comments. And do like, comment, and share this uh, live on YouTube or on Facebook. Thank you so much for listening to the this episode of Directive Store. Thank you so much, Doctor Stout. I hate paperwork again. This one, <laughs> right? Again. <laughs> I, I, I'm waiting for the uh, AI uh, to take over the voice over. I probably transcribe everything as the uh, healthcare clinicians uh, dictate. There you Sorry. go. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining in for this live or if you're hitting the replay. We'll see you in the next episode of Direct Shift Stories. And you will also see lots of short stories of uh, whatever Dr. Chris Stout had shared with us. Thank you so much, Wamshi, uh, for your valuable time. Thank you all. Uh, see you in the next episode. Bye bye. Take care. Thank you.